Yeah, welcome to the June edition of the Tell Researchers at Lancaster series uh, with Dr. Tunde uh, Varga Atkins. Um, really excited um, to hear today speak. So, my name is John Brindle. I'm going to be hosting today. Um, we also have uh, two moderators today. So, we have Pu Yin Wong and we have Abby Shaw, who are going to be moderating and, and supporting. So, I'd like to formally introduce Tunde, but she can also introduce herself. Um, so I've got a list um, a list of things that I have to say about Tunde, uh, as well as being a, a colleague and a friend. Um, it's Dr. Tunde Varga Atkins. Um, she's a principal fellow of the HEA, a senior educational developer and the interim head of digital education for the Centre for Innovation in Education at the University of Liverpool. Um, I'd like, uh, like us all to give a, a warm Tell researchers at Lancaster, welcome to Tunde. So Tunde, um, I'll pass over to you. Hi everyone and thank you very much for the invites and uh, I am very delighted to, to be talking about what I love, which is research. <laughs> and uh, let me just share my screen as well. Yes, yeah, so uh, as, as John introduced me, I'm working as an educational developer and um, so research is not cart core part of my role but it's something that I really love and enjoy doing and so it's more of a labor of love and part of my identity and today I um, chosen to talk about um, so thank you again for for letting me in a sense to talk about this uh, I chosen to talk about my multimodal practices as a tell practitioner and in particular research methods and I'll explain why I'm going to focus on this. But uh, before uh, we get started, I just wanted to set uh, your expectations in terms of this session. So as John mentioned, I would love this to be an um, interactive session, which is really also the modeling how I, approaching, uh, how I approach research. So my take on research is that everyone brings value, um, whether you're a researcher or a participant. Uh, you all bring ideas uh, and experiences to the interaction and whether the interaction is an interview or focus group or a, another method. And so you will both benefit and shape that um, interaction and the outcomes. So I, I'm talking about if you've experienced it as a researcher, when your participants tell you at the end of, let's say, an interview or a focus group, oh, I really haven't thought about my practice in that way, that is really a magic moment. And I think that probably illustrates what I'm talking about. So there is that magic spark, that co-construction moment. And this is what I wanted to bring to this session. So I'm hoping you would be up for it. Um, and oh, I haven't, I've loosely planned sort of, we don't need to, I haven't planned for 90 minutes. It will also depend on your interaction. So we can wrap up earlier if, so we will just see how we go is, is what I'm trying to say. And um, the other, the, I guess what I'm hoping for you from this session is that I will share uh, some ideas that, and some of the experiences that I have come across or I have experienced as a tell researcher and, and focusing on the research methods and how I have used them. But I would also love if you then shared your experiences because I'm sure you have got them as well with research methods that you have used and then hopefully we will all get some ideas from from this session that either things that we have shared or things that we might want to try in the future um, so and and also just because I can't not ask you to participate because as I said I'm an educational developer so talking at people for hours is not really <laughs> one of my one of the things that I'm about uh, so hopefully, you, as I said, you will be up for it. And um, if you could have a pen and paper ready for some activity, that would be great. And the other thing is that for the because I know we are recording this, but when we get to the interactive bits, if you can pause the recording so that people don't feel constrained by the fact that we are recording. So for the activities, we would definitely like to, if that's possible, Puyin and John. So that would be great. Okay, so um, yeah, so I'll 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 make a start, and I guess one of the things that Puyin and and uh, John and others asked me to to think about or talk about is the values um, and inspiration that I have for for my research, and and I guess again uh, continuing with the theme of being an educational developer, I'm very 
practice oriented in terms of my research activities. So I usually organize my research so that I can feed back its outcomes or the outcomes of projects into my practice. So I'm very interested in um, tell as a field um, and progressing the field, but also uh, magnifying not just what we can find out from the field, but um, looking at the research process, the research design and methodologies and methods that we use in our inquiries. So that, that's why I've chosen the fishing net as a, as a background uh, on this slide, because in a sense, I'm interested in not just catching the fish or what that may look like, but also looking at the net, the, the way we're doing things as a researchers and the methods that we use and, and keep reflecting on the usefulness and appropriateness of methods in relation to our inquiry and our research questions. So that, and also to be creative and adaptive um, if we need to be, so that we can find out the best possible results. And, I guess that's why I'm quite interested in multimodality as a concept and how we can bring multimodality to our research methods. So that's the what I'm hoping to explore today. And in a sense, I will I will offer a little bit more information or or about multimodality if if um, I'm sure you've all come across it. This idea that we've got different modes, uh, which are units of mo mm, meaning making, I guess, devices such as text, visuals, uh, movement, gestures, and so on, and then how we then orchestrate them with each other. And so how we can use these multimodal techniques or artifacts in our research to co-construct um, meaning as, as well as together. So I, I guess my interest in multimodality is that because of my, of the of my I don't know the degrees or during my lifetime I've worked a lot with diagrams drawings whether it was for mathematic problem solving or or literature language and culture some of the visual artifacts that we have got um, so I've got I guess quite an interest in stuff beyond words is basically what I'm trying to say um, and then finally I guess. Um, you will probably see if you see my research outputs that most of them are fruits of collaboration and collaboration and collegiality. It might be coming again with my disciplinary background, but also that I really enjoy collaborating on research with colleagues because we all bring, they all bring something unique to a collaboration. And, and I think it's something that I really enjoy doing. And I don't know, some of you will be from the Lancaster program as well. So I, it's something that I really encourage you to do as well, because it's been very rewarding in my practice to work with another. And, and it's almost like a relay team where you, uh, because research is sometimes on the back burner, is not something main in my role. So having others to help you along with the next step, and then you take up the baton and take it forward is something that's quite useful. Okay, so um, in terms of going on, so I guess the core element that really interests me is how we use multimodal research methods to enhance our inquiry. And just to continue with my visual metaphor of the fish, fishing and fishnet. So if we take the fishnet to represent the research methods that we use, such as interviews or focus groups, then there is a lot of prior work that we do as researchers to design and create these fish nets. So whether the composition and the size of the nets or the structure and the framework representing, I guess, in, my, in, in this case, the theories or the frameworks and the concepts we might use. So um, they will have all been carefully selected and designed to suit our current inquiry. So although I'm focusing on research methods in a collective sense today, I just wanted to, for you to conjure up this idea that every fishnet in the picture is different, looks differently. So that's the way I'm going to talking about it, that in a sense, just imagine the the theories and methodologies there um, that we've already decided to do. And um, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that how multimodal techniques can enhance the fishing process, 
uh, and not necessarily just to capture the fish because that's probably a wrong metaphor to use and I'm not really uh, trying to hold poor fish in, in uh, captivity. It's more just uh, a visual metaphor for that process. But um, so I guess what is, is the, how we can enhance uh, perhaps purely verbal interaction in, in using other methods. Um, how can we create new nets perhaps or enhance existing nets or how, how can we mix it all up? And um, so, yeah, that's, that's the interest and that, that has always been my interest um, in this. And one, one thing before going uh, to talk a little bit more about multimodality is um, just to share with you an anecdote um, that has defined my um, role as a researcher quite a bit. Well, not quite a bit, but it's something that I always have the, at the back of my mind when I'm designing or uh, creating um, research and, um, and interactions with participants, whether it's surveys or focus groups or another way. So one, one thing that happened to me early on in my career is that I was being interviewed, which is probably a wrong thing because I much prefer to be on the other end. But um, we started the interview and the very first question to me was basically so complicated that I just completely froze and drew a blank and couldn't answer it because it was quite a complicated question with various concepts and not just even about the concept but how I then applied those concepts in my practice so just completely froze and I don't even remember what the question was but just this sense of oh my word I can't answer this question so um, I mean please be reassured that we did a good interview we had a little bit of a break and the interviewer just recalibrated the questions and it was all fine and I was able to answer the rest of the questions. But just it's at the back of my mind always when we design um, various um, topic guides or, or interactions with participants, this sense of, of um, can they answer always moving from something concrete to abstract, from something easy to complex so that um, they can really, they don't need to know all the theories and the concepts uh, behind things. It's, we really need to relate to their experience so that they can answer uh, questions. And, and also it's that, again, enhancing this interaction and it, the, the, I guess the, their answer is always as good as, as we are to, to be able to elicit their experiences. So again, uh, multimodality, I'm just flagging this example because I'm guessing that my interest in multimodal approaches is, is exactly this to uh, how can we enhance this process of elicitation and co-construction. Okay, so what is multimodality? So again, some of you will be very familiar with this. And in a sense, our culture is so multimodal now. It's, it's, uh, we probably will find struggle to find things that are not multimodal, but it's a so social semiotic perspective. Um, and the idea is that we communicate and make meaning through a range of modes and interactions. And mode is a, a unit of meaning making. So for instance, it can be an image, text or writing, sound, color, style, gesture, moving image. And multimodality is obviously a combination of these. So this idea that additional layers of meaning can be created from the way these different modes are structured, laid out or aesthetically organized or framed. And then again, other lay layers of meaning can come from how these different modes are orchestrated or relate to each other. And I guess, let me give you a few examples and this will be a very, um, I just wanted to give a quick and easy example, and it's uh, something that probably will be familiar to you as well, the TPAC diagram. So drawings, diagrams, infographics are all examples of multimodal artifact, and they comprise a combination of text um, and visuals, which all carry extra meaning. So, for instance, uh, we can ask interviewees to, to gather um, or collect or annotate or even create these multimodal artifacts as part of our interaction, as part of the data collection. So why would we do that? Why would we ask participants to do this? Why 
don't we just want to talk to them? Because um, as, as I said, they can carry extra meaning. So again, it's a very simple example. It's almost like too simple, but just um, to say the example with the TPAC diagram, obviously the Venn diagram has a particular meaning. And the fact that we've got um, three kinds of knowledge domains represented from here from teachers in, in three circles. And so this extra meaning that we see from here is that each domain is given the same size and it looks similar. And the, like, the fact that they are overlaid or expressed in a Venn diagram means that there is some overlay and addition and at the intersection of that. So again, you could probably analyze the color um, and how things are organized. But, but for instance, the, the really important meaning that's communicated by the fact that this is a diagram is the overlay and the fact that the three domains are seen as equally important. And other educational researchers have used lots of um, other diagrams. So for instance, concept maps, uh, mind maps in, in getting um, students to talk about their experiences. So in, in, in all of this, the commonality is that we are trying to get students or participants to convey some extra meaning that we might not get by just asking them to talk about their experiences with words. Okay, that, and I think the other thing I wanted to talk about really today is that we need to then know the genres of these multimodal artifacts at our disposal as researchers, and I will demonstrate that in, in when we come to the activity. But if anyone wanted to read on this, um, um, one of your colleagues or uh, at Lancaster, Natasha Lotskovic, she has done a lot of work on inquiry graphics in higher education. So if anyone wanted to look at her work, I mean, this one is, it's actually talks about the use of graphics in education, but she, the, the whole approach is this social semiotic approach. So um, looking at it will also be relevant for educational research as well. And as I mentioned today, I will focus on, on research methods. And the usual suspects are, and I'm sure you all are doing stuff with these things. So surveys, observation, interviews, and focus groups. And I'm guessing we could say, or maybe I, I wrote, I sort of thought about this sentence, but I'm actually thinking, should we change that? Should I change this? But maybe it's something I can ask you to have a reaction to that, uh, whether these methods have changed a lot over the years, because these are the typical methods we come across when we hear about educational research. And Peter Kahn noted that, that there is a need for methodological innovation in the area of pedagogic research, because the, are, are there perhaps other methods at our disposal that we could be using? So in a sense, I will, I will reflect on this a little bit. Um, because one of the questions, uh, you all being interested in pair research, is that our digital landscape has changed massively, considerably, and ha has it influenced or changed our research methods that we use for education? And in a sense, today I will sort of use a digital lens on um, So one of the plans here is that I reflect or I will highlight how I've used these methods in my practice with a multimodal, but also a digital lens as a tel practitioner. And we will do a bit of a historical comparison and discuss some of the more recent affordances of technologies uh, in relation to these methods. So before that, I wanted to just briefly highlight my roadmap as a researcher, but I don't really want to focus on my on the chronology, but I will, what I will do is I will relate to my pre these methods and show you where I've used these methods in these different projects. So I very first started on a European e-learning project called the e-learning place, which was a cross-sector project across um, business, um, so hard to reach learners basically, but all, all the educational factors. I also did a uh, evaluation for BACTA as the, those two years were um, on a school base so basically schools in Liverpool and um, looking at the teachers professional development and since I've became a learning technology educational developer I've been involved in a number of institutional evaluation and research projects around TEL so whether it was e or I will talk a little bit about those as well. 
and then obviously um, the PhD. And, but I will come back to those. Um, I, I didn't want to detail them now because it's probably less interesting for you. But let's look at surveys. And you will see that it's, um, I'm, I'm sure you, you're the same. It's quite a well-used method. It's something that I've used quite a bit in, in my practice. Um, whether it was, and then I will, I will just move you along. So um, whether it was VLE baseline evaluation with staff or students or online submission and marking experiences of staff and students or digital literacies of staff. Um, but one, one thing I wanted to highlight is that again, very early, very early um, in my uh, research um, career, uh, as I mentioned, this uh, European project on disadvantaged learners and using digital television uh, for their learning. One of the things I was tasked with is uh, designing an evaluation questionnaire for these um, participants, I guess. And I came up with a, a singing and dancing three-page evaluation survey and didn't really consider that that might not be the best um, method to use with people who might um, not value a three-page survey on, um, on their learning experiences. It was only text only. And I guess, again, I wanted to just reflect on surveys and it would be interesting to hear about your experiences that uh, some of the multimodal opportunities we, we might have. So we know, all know that students suffer from survey fatigue, especially around higher education surveys. And also, I don't know if how you find, but sometimes the quality of free text re responses can be quite, well, if they fill it out, then that's good. But then sometimes the quality of those free text responses are not very detailed. So I am wondering if there's opportunity here to for better engagement, uh, perhaps if we looked at some multimodal use of surveys, um, it's also probably closer to student experiences who are very probably on Instagram and in other ways are doing a lot of multimodal uh, interactions. And more importantly, could we access different layers of experiences when we talk to students about their experiences? So for instance, one um, prominent theme currently with higher education is student belonging. But can you imagine getting a I don't know, a like a scale statement as a student. I do feel um, much belonging to the university, strongly agree, strongly disagree to perhaps asking them to, I don't know, identify parts of the university in visual form or so. And I, I just think that there could be interesting scope in here. Uh, in terms of looking at a digital lens, the surveys as a method, if I go back to my very first um, survey, in 2001, um, paper-based. Um, so nowadays, online forms and surveys, you, we don't really even think twice of, of doing them. They're so, um, I guess, um, it's so so easy to access them. And also in terms of the visuals that we might use, there's just so much more symbols, images that are pro prominent and well-known that could be used in these surveys. So I guess in terms of multimodal opportunities for surveys, um, the, as I mentioned um, with the example visual surveys, I'm wondering if if that, I actually I wanted to know if you have come across them, but it's something definitely that I think that could be a lot of scope to explore. And I tried to look at surveys and I also asked on Twitter if people knew about survey tools that enable images either as part of the options for participants to choose or whether part of the question text. And there are a few of these examples here that I found, which are interesting. So um, it would definitely be of interesting to, to try that. So, and could I ask you, I mean, have you used any visual tools or visual surveys? Or perhaps can you see any research interest or topics that could benefit from a visual survey tool? Thank you. Observation as a, as a method. 
and it's been quite interesting to reflect on this and how I, I guess I mainly use observation in the school um, projects, to school research and evaluation projects that I've used uh, in, in this case. So I don't know if anyone remembers the LAMS, the Learning Activity Management System that came from Australia and is something that was piloted in specialist schools in the UK around 2005. And so we went in and uh, looked at how the teachers were using uh, this platform with the students in class, but it, it also was used in, to some extent in universities, but maybe the evaluation was for me uh, with schools. So uh, I'm just going to flick forward here because it is just so interesting. I mean, sorry, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry if, if that, this might not be interesting, but it was definitely interesting for me to reflect on like even this 17 years difference when we were like dragging like mules, these cameras into schools with the mini discs, the mi um, tripods, microphones, and compared uh, with the technologies we have now and the Zoom Teams Canvas and a video much more accessible. But I guess when we are observing things, or especially classroom um, setting, then do we really need video? What is it that we are recording with video? I know, know Phil is here who's used video recordings quite a bit in your research. And then thinking about what we started discussing before, what is exactly our data? What is we that we are observing? How are we gonna analyze the multimodal product of these um, interactions. So that's all, all really interesting questions around there. And then uh, I guess another thing that's changed, so perhaps a few years ago, it was us going into physical classrooms to do observations, but it's a lot more nuanced nowadays observation because it can take in so many forms. We can have actually the online meetings, recordings, and observe asynchronously. But we also can have a lot of the digital footprint from students and staff. In a sense, they are observation data as well, trace data or analytics data that we can use as researchers. And I guess um, in terms of current and future trends, uh, 360 degree video is quite an interesting development. If anyone wanted to have a look, Simon Cross and colleagues have done some uh, research around uh, using 360 video for teacher training in rural areas and but but also I guess how it can expand the asynchronous uh, um, opportunities for observation across space and time because you could have a recording a 360 recording and um, have a discussion around it but in a different time to to when the episode has actually happened. And there's also another really interesting um, article by Keo Halloran and colleagues on how we might, um, the, the use of multimodal video, but also around student engagement. So if anyone wanted to look at that. So I guess, again, I'm just reflecting how observation has changed over time in, in our digital landscape. And then this is a shameless plug because Simon Cross's chapter is in the book that's just um, been published this week that I co-edited with colleagues. And it's, it's been an amazing collaboration, another collaboration I've really enjoyed doing. So if anyone wanted to have a look or come to our book launch in September, I'm just shamelessly plugging that. But there's also a part two of the book out of the three parts is on research. And Kyung Mi is here, she's one of the authors. Um, so you will see some familiar frames, faces from Lancaster and I'm sure familiar faces across the whole book. Uh, but the, the middle part is research. So that we, that's really interesting. Um, um, okay, so let's move on to interviews and interview plus, I guess. So when I'm talking about, um, let me just see. As, as a research method. And again, uh, it's something that I'm always on the lookout for in um, multimodal methods. So by interview plus, I mean, usually some there is some activity in the interview, probably a multimodal activity from what I'm talking about today. And it's I'm sure you've experimented with things like this as well. Um, so where I've used some way of, of using some multimodal method to enhance the interview process. Uh, so these will be, so as you can tell, I've used interviews quite a bit in my practice. 
And what I've experimented with quite a bit is using drawings and diagrams, so getting participants to draw or, or do diagrams in interviews. So, as I mentioned um, in the particular project with the schools, I asked the teachers, so again, this was early on in my, I guess, my research journey. I asked teachers and head teachers as well, because uh, some of the research was with head teachers to draw their professional practice and their professional development. Uh, so that was some of the drawings I got uh, on the left. And as you can see, there is quite a lot of writing on it. So I, when I asked them to draw something, I, I wasn't really clear of what exactly I wanted them to draw. And so I was a little bit like I got a lot of text back and not really what uh, almost like the essence I was trying to get at from their experiences. Uh, but you can see there's a telephone which represents connections and there is the, uh, the pyramid and pie chart. So there is some way of sort of analyzing what, what some of those things could mean for them. And then you also see on the right there's a network diagram and we clearly, um, in that case, we really wanted them to identify the networks that they were relying on. So I guess what um, this idea of, well, I asked people to draw, but I'm not, I, was I clear enough or what exactly, or what was I trying to get? So it, it led us uh, with Mark, my colleague as well, and then with other collaborators to really dig into uh, a little bit deeper on almost like a genres of multimodal artifacts and what is it that we're trying to get at uh, by asking people to draw what, um, because the representations that we're asking them will also then define or influence the sort of things they say about it. So I think I really liked, I think, Cassie, you were talking a lot. I mean, even just when you talked about your journey, you, you said some emotive verbs like, uh, was it scared or or uh, then the later on you went on to excitement. And these are so, some of the more emotional reactions as well that you can sometimes get at drawings or visual metaphors that you might not get in, in other ways. And uh, so that I think that that came out really well from your, your drawing as well. So, I, so, so we did this almost like exploration of, of when is it when we ask people to do drawings as in like graphic um, drawings as opposed to perhaps particular diagrams and what was the difference, what sort of different data we got back. So in, in the group B task, when I asked you to draw a timeline, I guess as researchers, we might opt for a timeline because we want people to identify key moments and perhaps whether they were positive or negative. So we're trying to really hook on particular aspects, aspects of that experience. But when um, I think Abby, you were talking about the object and and feel as well, and also the uh, what was the the drawing of the newness that you were talking about. Um, I guess in that sense, the drawing or the visual metaphor really tries and captures a salient experience of of um, of your experience. So and um, so there is. I guess what my, my, I'm saying that depending on what kind of genre we ask people to use, it will really influence the kind of experiences and the data that we get. So in, here is another example of, of Camille Conical House and using concept maps uh, where she was mapping students' engagements at university and I guess identifying the areas of, of their um, experiences that were prominent for students and how they then link to each other. So again, she used concept maps because she really wanted to explore these interrelations and also just what dimensions were present for students when, when they were talking about or looking at exploring students' engagement. Okay, so, um, uh, so there's so, so much more stuff. I mean, th there's, I would love to perhaps ask you what as participants you thought of when you people ask you to do a drawing, because again, like my experience is especially if you think about some of the head teachers that I uh, asked to draw. So some of them got out their, um, I don't know, colorful pen set and others just put the pen down and said, I'm not doing this. This is too childish. 
So I guess as a researcher, we need to be mindful of people's reactions and preferences and just work with that as well. So that's also an interesting aspect when you ask participants to do certain activities. Here we had some people uh, leave the session because they didn't want, for, for whatever reason, it, it's fine, uh, didn't want to do the interactive task. And again, that just again, as researchers, we have to be ready for that. And, and um, I, I suppose adapt our techniques. So if, yeah, so yeah, that's all I need to say about that. Again, a, a nice uh, digital lens on interviews um, and drawings, diagrams in interviews that, and as you can tell in back in 2005, it was very much paper-based drawings that we were asking people to do. You didn't really have any technologies or laptops weren't really be as around so that we could ask participants to, we would have had to almost like book a room to be able to, to do, um, ask people um, to do these drawings. And also when I was trying to get that article published on drawings and diagrams, it was very difficult to engage journals or uh, especially um, because it's a qualitative method, I found it really hard in terms of publishing it. And whereas now, if you again, look at um, around us, the visual collaboration tools that we have um, for digitally and, and also on, on just the templates that we have available are much more prominent. And also interestingly, the journals and the publication sphere has changed quite a bit. So here you can see there's an article we co-authored um, with colleagues at Liverpool. And in this case, the FEBS Open Bio now asks people to provide an infographic abstract for articles, which I think, again, is a, is a really interesting idea that hopefully improves um, readability and some, some further dissemination of papers. So again, that's just a, an interesting reflection from a digital lens on using diagrams and drawings as part of the interview. So, and, and, and then just continuing in the same vein, I guess, um, I as researcher has, uh, and I'm sure you have as well, it's just so much easier to use these sort of things in our interviews, especially as we're doing a lot of interviews now online. So here in my current project in um, on signature pedagogies, we're using Jamboards, which is this online post-it note tool by Google, where we got, um, um, lecturers to talk about signature pedagogies in their discipline. So for instance, in French and identifying that and then using the same Jamboard across a number of interviews to then collect data. So whereas previously you might have had to have a group together to do that in the same room, in the same location, in the same time and space. Again, some of these digital technologies enabled us to do these things asynchronously and iteratively, which I think, again, is a really interesting um, development. Okay, just looking at time. And um, one thing, I, another thing I wanted to share with you is um, a focus group and nominal group technique is, again, a method that I've used quite a bit, especially around curriculum evaluation projects. So this is when we ask students usually about uh, what, what are the experiences that we should keep or anything that we change in terms of the, the their experience. And nominal group technique, I don't know how many of you may know about this, but it's a method that I came across when we were supporting our School of Medicine with evaluating their curriculum. And it, it seemed to be a really good method because it was democratizing students' um, feedback because what this method is, is that you get a group of students or a good group of participants together. You might have one or two questions to explore. So for instance, what could we improve for you? And then everyone makes a post-it note on making their own individual suggestions, which are then shared and displayed together uh, as a group. And then you get um, a this into a discussion or round robin phase when all of the responses are read out loud. You try and merge the ones that are similar. And then in the final uh, stage, uh, you then renumber some of these items and you then ask um, each, of the each of the participants to rank 
and vote on their top five items. So the end of at the end of the session, there's a prioritized rank, ranked list, an actionable list to. So these are the things that we all think uh, should be changing first, second, and so on. So uh, I've I thought so I've used this method method quite a bit um, institutionally, and then. Some of uh, with colleagues, what we ended up doing is combining this with focus groups, because what we found that with um, some of the nominal group technique, the students didn't have as good a recall of all the things that they experienced as students. So whereas focus group, because they are about shared learning experience, um, really help participants to to remember, I guess, to some of the things that they experience. So what we ended up doing is developing a combined method where we start off with a focus group and then we end up with a nominal uh, voting or ranking stage. And the benefit of this is what we found. And, and again, I can hopefully um, um, what summarize this. So the benefits of, of the combined method is that we give an equal voice to all the participants because one of the things that happen, can happen in focus groups is that you might have some dominant, dominant vocal voices. And then also one of the things we notice that the ownership of, of the participants is much better because they know what is the outcome immediately from that list. And it also helps stakeholders prioritize the actions. Whereas with focus group outcomes, you might have the researcher interpret um, what are the actionable lists, but in this case, because it's the participants and the students do that, it's much easier. And the other thing uh, that we found with focus groups is that especially some of our science colleagues didn't really consider it as a representative, rigorous, um, I mean, as, as mixed method or qualitative researcher is quite hard to take, but that was their perception. And by having this ranked prioritized list of items, uh, even they sort of were convinced a little bit about the rigor and the trust of, of the method. But one, one of the things with this nominal uh, group technique or nominal focus groups I wanted to just highlight is how much easier it is now to do this using technologies that, uh, because when, when I was looking at this method for, for the very first time, we could only really use it with post-it notes and, and manual ranking. But now if you look at some of the tools like Linoid, Padlet, um, all, all those sort of tools, it's, it's much more. So I think it's just an interesting example of a method that was predating some of the technological affordances. So just because I'm talking about some of the digital lens on these methods, it was definitely a method when the digital tools weren't available for it at the time. And I did wonder if there's any methods that you might be using that you feel, oh, we can't really do this with technologies. Or it might be the opposite that almost like going back to, um, um yeah pen and paper might be but i'm just looking at time and thinking there's only really 15 minutes left so rather than me talking more at you i i don't know if you wanted to open it up any questions or discussion um rather than me sort of finishing things off because i'm just as i said i would be just interested in how you've used so thanks jen for sharing yours uh, any other I guess stories around these methods or the digital ways in which you might be using that, any plans that you might be doing for your research? The question about your use of Jamboard or Miro or whatever, those, you know, um, sticky notes platforms. So I, I've done something similar recently with like a focus group. Like, and so I, I thought, you know, a bit like what you're saying about allow people that their own time and um, space, space to do their own, you know, express their opinions or whatever but I found their response is quite limiting people just go like yeah I agree yeah that's good I don't agree with it so it's kind of quite frustrating and then I had to revert you mean back when to they had already something on the board and they had yeah to yeah yeah so, so I posted some big questions and then I found the quantity of the the the, the information is quite limiting some people were quite generous with with writing an essay but some people just like I disagree and then they just, you know, so mm -hmm, I just wonder mm -hmm. what are your 
So, experience. I mean, the way we have used it, because I had a core researcher, Rika, uh, who I just mentioned, uh, is that uh, we were doing it. I mean, we did offer people the option. Uh, so obviously the very first interviewee had a blank board because it, we, they were the first one, the, let's say the French, first French lect lecturer of French. And so they, and then, uh, so we were, I was asking interview questions and then Rika were typing them on the gem board. So it wasn't them who edit things, but my core researcher. And then in the subsequent interviews where we had, let's say another lecturer, French lecturer of French come, we asked them to look at what was already there and exactly what you said, like either, does it resonate? Do you agree with this? Or is there anything else that you want adding? And then because we were doing it as part of the interview, so I didn't, I mean, I, we, they, they could do add things. So there were some people who edit things before the interview because the option was them, for them to do it. And then we just went through the interview and asked them more questions about that. So I think it's, it, it, it depends because whether you, that's your primary data collection bit or whether that's part of the interview and that's just a, almost like a side product of that conversation or a pre-product. So it just depends on how you set it up. But I know I, I know it can get frustrating if you don't get much response. But in that sense, was this part of an interview or did you more use it as a sort of like a survey tool in a sense? Well, the, the plan was to use it as an asynchronous focus group, mm -hmm. but because I wasn't right. getting the, the richness that I, I wanted. Yeah. Um, so I then had to revert back to doing interviews. But I think it was a good um not not as, not the same approach but similar it was i it was good for me to use the data to form mm -hmm. some questions so then i ended up doing unstructured interviews based on the responses that people got and then as people get talking everything just opens up so yeah that's what you mean about that core construction space that when people yeah. are just faced with a, a blank gem board or a or some of the questions they might need that little bit of core thinking around to tease out and that can be beneficial but if that's not your aim or you're trying to do some other things but I just find that because people are so busy sometimes the only space or mental space they've got available is the interview space so it's sometimes it's about their mental space that they don't have it is what we are trying to ask of them but if they don't have it it's very difficult to give and I think we just have to be mindful of that but yeah it can be frustrating if you've set it up and you really want it to work it's all part of the learning curve isn't that you try something it works it doesn't work and then you but then you don't, don't have really any if if people are time poor which a lot of people are students and staff then it, it there's nothing we can do about that either so yeah yeah John, you got your hand up. Yeah, I mean, I'm the host, so I should have just like muted you and and, and kind of taken <laughs> over, shouldn't I? But you know, <laughs> so I was gonna I was gonna bring in something about rich diagram because I, I know that Sunday, Tunde knows I've done quite a lot of work on 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 this uh, in the past with the um, management school and things like that um, but the idea of rich diagram is really good and I was going to kind of just jump on what you were saying to you in about getting people to participate. You gave we uh, done it with academics and students and you give them all a sector to think about or a section of the diagram to think about and you group them together to think about that and then you move them around each sector so they have to add something and one of the rules that we use particularly in the rich diagramming is that they weren't allowed to write anything you could only draw mm -hmm. pictures to represent their thoughts um, and you end up with a we, we used it to situate a program well three programs and a and a service so a career service within the wider context of industry but then also um, we looked at uh, with students where they see themselves in industry and um, because they were you know students who were coming in on a professional MBA program and they so it's, it's really cool and, and I've never thought of it as multimodality before Tunde, I've never come across that phrase before. So. I mean, there's that, that's the beauty of it, that there's so many different things. So like mm -hmm. my colleagues, I don't know if Will is still here, but mm -hmm. they, um, based with colleagues in the management school, they're doing, uh, what's it called, the diamond ranking. So there's so, so many different things that we can use. And I think what fascinates me is just how we can find these things for the research questions that we are trying to find out. So that diamond ranking, for instance, is really good when you're trying to get people to define things that are most important and least important to them, because a lot of things will be sort of in the middle. But when the, I think it's in relation to VLE use, 
So, but then there will be lots of these different techniques that we can use as part of interviews, focus groups, and other things. And it's just, I think that's the creative and beautiful thing about is finding the relevant and the right ones, or perhaps creating the ones that we really need. And and that's the thinking because I mean, I I, I really loved was it you Panagiota who started off your your drawing and the journey and immediately you brought into aspects of it I'm not sure we would have got if we talked about things or for instance one of one of mine um, when I was uh, doing some interviews on staff digital literacies and again I asked them to do a visual metaphor of what it would represent to them and one of them said uh, sink or swim that that's what conjures up when we talk about digital literacies and again with the sink or swim it there is a lot expressed in that quite a concise some fear some pressure external pressure and it's not necessarily something that you would have got immediately if I just asked them about well what do you think about digital literacies from staff members so it's always that that's what really interests me of getting at things that we might not get at otherwise that's probably not the formal way of saying it but that's here we go okay but thanks John that I mean yeah I think it's that's really interesting all these methods that we can use anyone else I know Phil you've used videos for instance in your research don't know if you wanted to share anything with that We've got time for probably one one more question yeah, or comment. Yeah. I was, about to, I was about to say that for you. <laughs> uh, the only thing I was going to say is um, it's the challenge with video is to get the um, the emotive stuff across. So sometimes people use video for consumption, if that makes sense, or they use it for like archival and retrieval of visual stimulus, whereas um, the idea um for certainly the research we were doing was to get people involved in creating and um exposing and aggravating contradictions using visual stimuli if that's okay i won't bang on too long because i can see john just clawing through the screen to tell me to shut up <laughs> no, <it's fine. laughs> um, but yeah that was the the big the biggest challenge of it i suppose was using it to expose and aggravate contradictions rather than just observe and think well wasn't that nice if that makes sense and i think that does relate back to quite a lot that you brought out it was great thanks yeah i mean again like i think i also like that uh, if you're asking people to relate for for instance to the same visual or whatever even if it's an object even if it's your kazoo it would be interesting to see if we ask the people here what well what conjures what are the thoughts that you associate with that and so I think that that can generate some really interesting discussions as well but okay I'll uh, finish off as well but thank you so much for letting me play and um, you know talk about this this stuff uh, which I, I really love doing and so thank you for engaging as bringing your knowledge and experiences to this session as well I really appreciate it